Now, first up, we have Mr. Nottingham uh, from Distill talking about video SEO. Phil, do you want to come on up? Um, now, he gave me some stupid job title, like head of memes and trolling at Distill that he did. But he knows a lot about video Isn't SEO. Is this and the one? going to talk about it. Yeah, that should do the trick. Smash in. Good morning slash afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Today's question comes from Phil in Brighton. And Phil asks, Matt, what is the best way to optimize my video content? Well, Phil, probably the best thing for you to do is to upload all your videos onto YouTube.com and then pay for loads and loads of ads. I prefer cats to dogs. There's some uh, fairly questionable advice out there. There's some fairly questionable impersonations of Matt Cuts as well. Um, and I think the most insidious of these is the idea that you need to spend a fortune to do anything good with video marketing. And the problem is most people start with this kind of process. They think, oh, great, video, that's going to be amazing. Uh, let's make a video. And then, of course, they'll come up with an idea. They'll pay for a creative agency to make the video. They'll then upload it to YouTube. They'll optimize it, whatever that means. They'll then pay for loads of pre-roll advertising, and you end up with this kind of situation, where you've got loads and loads of views, and you're unable to drive any ROI from it because nobody is actually engaging with the content. And you're doing this to Google, and they're like this, and you feel like this. <laughs> but you know what? There's a better way. And today, I just want to share with you a few things that you can do just to improve the efficacy and the value you're going to get from your video campaigns um, without spending a fortune. So I'm Phil Nottingham. I'm a uh, worker distilled. My job title for today's presentation is Head of Trolling and Memes. And I'm going to talk about video hacks. So to start with, what are we going to create? What kind of video are we going to do? Well, this is what most people do. This is the process most people follow. They think, OK, video, great. Um, what can we do a video about? OK, got a great idea. Make the video, and then we go and optimize it. And this is terrible, because video is not content. Video is a media type. It's a form. It's like text or image. And form must follow function, as we all know. Um, so the best approach is actually a strategic approach, which is to take a goal-driven strategy. So start with going, what do we need to improve? What's going to be the best way to do that? Is it going to be video? If so, then you can define the technical and creative strategy. So you use video when it's the right form of content for an idea, and you let the business goals drive both the technical and the creative. And I think there's three main goals for video across the board. You either want to increase traffic and conversions on your own site, um, sort of like product video kind of stuff. You want to increase your brand awareness, get better known, or you want to build links and social shares back to your site. So how can you work out, as an SEO, as a marketer, whatever, what kind of video you should create? How can you work out what your audience is going to care about? Well, the core of it is that you need to know your customer conversion funnel. And you need to know those areas where you can improve the conversion rate through video. It may be that you need more people to know about you. It may be that you just don't have that fame that you deserve yet. Or it may be that actually your conversion rate is very poor, and you need better content on certain pages to improve those. But there's a few hacks that you can use to just work out some quick wins. One is internal site search. What are people actually searching for on your site? This is a great way to find out things that they might be interested in in terms of content. Secondly, keyword research. What are people searching for on Google um, and Bing and all that sort of stuff? That's going to give you a good indication of what your audience might care about. You can do persona research. Who are you targeting and what are they going to be interested in? You can do competitor analysis. Anyone doing anything good in your industry that you can copy? Anyone doing anything good in other industries that you might be able to replicate and turn into your own? OK, so assuming you've come up with this great idea, how are you then going to go and make that video? There's going to be a few people in the audience who are going to say this. And I call bullshit. <laughs> I think it's lazy. <clears throat> if you can get 7,500 pounds, you can create yourself a really good video studio that will create good content for you. But in fact, if you spend 5,000 pounds, you can get a pretty good video studio that's going to create great content for you. And you can do the same with 1,000 pounds. Anyone think they can't raise 1,000 pounds? Get a new job. That crappy Matt Cuts video that I made, that was done with pretty much this 1,000 pounds studio shopping list. Not expensive. But then you're thinking, yeah, but you know what? We don't have the skills, and you've probably got some editing background, and you need some of that to be able to do any video. Yeah, but you know what? The freelancers who do know all this stuff are actually really cheap. Some good places to find them here. And there's tons of resources online to help you learn if you want to just get good editing and that kind of stuff. So no more objections. Production. How do you set up this studio that you've bought, this equipment that you've got for filming? Well, the core of it is really to use lighting to ensure that you're getting the best picture possible. Lighting is more important than anything else in terms of getting a good picture. I'd rather spend money on some really good lights than a really good camera. And the core of it is you need to balance out so you get rid of that shadow. The one on the left, all I've done is just shoved a great big fat orange light on my face. Um, and the one on the right, I've got two lights. And I've got a backlight like this 
So two lights and a backlight just cutting out that shadow and illuminating me in a very natural way, and it looks so much more professional. This is our lighting studio here. Greaseproof paper for the win. If you can't afford to go and get one of those great big sort of soft boxes or an LED um, strip or something like that, literally just get a normal tungsten light and a, uh, some greaseproof paper and you will get a nice soft glow. Easy, easy, super cheap. Gents, this is a problem in our industry. <laughs> Unfortunately, if you're going to be wearing that kind of stuff on videos, you'll notice that the interlacing goes weird and it all kind of screws up and it's crazy. We need to kick the habit, guys. We really do. OK, so you've got your raw footage. How do you get that looking good in post-production? Well, again, the core is really get the lighting looking good and then just tweak the brightness and contrast in any sort of editing program and then add some grading and a vignette. The vignette will really make it look polished and make it look so professional. It takes 10 seconds and you can learn to do it sort of very, very quickly just by searching for a tutorial. Um, you can get something very, very basic in the top left and turn it into something that looks pretty damn good, um, crappy model aside, uh, really without spending any money at all. And good sound is actually more important than good picture. We cannot stand videos that have terrible sound. You can kind of cope with something if the image is a little bit rough, but something that is inaudible is just, you know, it's not fit for purpose. Uh, so really the core kind of thing, if you're doing um, voice service or you're recording voice or speech or whatever, get the microphone as close as possible to the person. Now this normally looks like using a, a lav mic like I'm wearing right now, or you can get like an overhead shotgun mic as well. Um, don't just use the microphone on the top of the camera because that distance will mean that you get lots of echo, you pick up all this kind of background noise. You want it as close to the face as possible. And lav mics are not that expensive. You can pick a, a nice one up for about 100 quid. Uh, if you want to do screencasting, so assume you maybe are in a software sort of niche, um, you want to record your software then, um, the best two options I think for the money are, they're both about 200 quid, um, ScreenFlow for Mac and Camtasia Studio for PC. Really, really nice, simple software, can get it looking really sharp. Um, additionally, you know what, you don't actually need to create everything from scratch with video. Um, you can use some stock footage to supplement anything you're going to record. Just add that little bit of extra bang. Like each of these are about 50 pounds to buy. Um, I knocked this together with a little logo in about five minutes. Um, didn't take long at all. Shutterstock has a really good library. So I'd recommend just sort of like augmenting stuff with the stock footage if, if needs be, if you can't afford to get animation done from scratch. Additionally, if you're trying to get like screenshots or anything done of software, then I would definitely have a look at something called placeit.breezy.com, which is literally just a free database of really nice images like this of different devices, laptops, iPads, whatever. And you can sort of drop your screenshot of your, um, of your actual uh, software or your website on there, and then you can sort of like use it to show somebody actually using this as if it were real and they were actually watching it on a device. Rather, much better to do this rather than just sort of taking a photo of it um, because it doesn't look that sharp. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. What am I like? Uh, additionally, if you are trying to do some animation, if you're going to pay for an animator to do some stuff, probably one of the most scalable and cost-effective ways to do this is to use a designer to actually build out the assets. Adobe Illustrator and Adobe After Effects are, work beautifully together. Um, and actually, you don't need to build all the animation from scratch. If you can go and build those vector-based nice assets, get a designer to do it in Illustrator, then it becomes very, very easy for an animator to do some slick stuff very, very quickly. OK, so that's how you're going to build the content. What if you want to outsource the whole process? There's tons and tons of these sort of services online that say, hey, you know, we'll do cheap, great video for you, and we'll do the whole thing, and just input your brief, and we'll make it all for you. Um, I have a bit of a problem with them, because you're able to outsource all this kind of stuff very easily. I don't have any problem with people outsourcing filming, editing, design, and animation. But when you use those kind of stock, out-of-the-box solutions, you end up outsourcing the stuff that really matters, your USP, your unique value as a business. You can't outsource knowing what you're talking about. You can't outsource the value that you bring as an individual expert to your product. It doesn't matter what it is, whether you're a consultant, whether you sort of make software, whether it's actual like, knowledge of your individual product. You need to be working with people on the videos. You cannot outsource the whole process and get something back that will be good. It will just be too generic. So out-of-the-box solutions are not as good as actually working with skilled videographers, and the cost is not prohibitively more expensive. I would recommend going and finding good freelancers, good freelance editors, small production, local production companies that you can work with properly. Um, and you know what? You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Because if you go and get somebody to come in for a day, maybe um, film loads of shots of your products, do interviews with all your members of staff, you can build up a library of content and then you can actually use this footage to re-edit loads and loads of videos. If you have a good library, then all the work is just on the editor making loads and loads of good stuff. And you can re-edit and repurpose things, which is much more cost effective than just paying for video after video after video from an outsourced company who will do a very generic job. OK, so you've made your video. What are you going to do with it now? So you might want to get more traffic to your site, probably. Uh, best way to do that is, of course, to use um, get video-rich snippets. This is a company called Kurtz & Bloom. They're a lawyer. 
A law firm in um, Raleigh, North Carolina, they saw a 14% 40 uh, sorry, increase in organic traffic uh, month on month just from implementing video rich snippets. Um, but you know what? The, uh, how do you do this? Well, you need to go and create a video sitemap or use video schema. I'm not going to tell you how to do this. Just Google it. It's very, very simple. Uh, I've written a post. Just search for video sitemaps. Um, and, but you're probably thinking, well, I don't know if my page is specifically going to benefit from video-rich snippets, because it's a product page. I could go for review-rich snippets. What's going to be the best thing for me? Well, my colleague, Tom Anthony, has actually built a tool which will allow you to test this for yourself. It's called SERP Turkey, and it works with Amazon Mechanical Turk. So you basically, you can go and um, get people to click on a dummy SERP result uh, that looks a bit like this. Uh, and basically collect all the data for click-through rates. So you can split test two versions with different rich snippets and see which one gets you more clicks. And he's augmented that to allow you to input custom HTML, uh, and it's a completely free tool, just Google SERP Turkey. Um, so one other thing you should be doing to try and get more traffic is creating transcriptions for all your videos and putting them in the HTML, not just uploading a .srt file or adding JavaScript or anything, actually in the bloody text. Why? Because A, it's valuable for users. If you're on a restricted connection or you're, maybe your company has a crappy old browser or you can't, use, um, you can't be watching videos at work or whatever, some people still want to be able to read the text and you can provide value that way. And more importantly, in some sense, for us SEOs, we all know how hard it is to get like, relevant, unique text for product pages. If you are creating like, product videos, that kind of thing, and then go and create transcriptions for them, you are creating unique, unique text content for those pages as well. Two birds with one stone, winning. <clears throat> If you want to kind of outsource this, the best paid transcription service that we found we tested a load at Distilled is SpeechPad, and it will normally cost you about a dollar a minute. Uh, probably people know about Facebook Open Graph. If you add the Open Graph tags, you can get stuff um, shown in the Facebook timeline. Uh, but you may not know about Twitter Cards, which does pretty much the same thing, and of course just increases the shareability and the watchability of your content by having people able to watch videos in the actual uh, sort of Twitter interface rather than going onto another site. Okay, so that's how you're going to get more traffic to your site. How do you build a great presence on YouTube? Um, I like to use the YouTube keyword tool for idea generation. The YouTube keyword tool is not particularly accurate, but it does give you a nice flavor of what kind of stuff people are searching for, um, various themes, work out kind of what sort of content you could create that's going to be relevant for the YouTube audience. So I, I'd use that. Um, make sure when you're like, tracking how your stuff's doing on YouTube that you measure engagement and not views. Views are not a major part of the YouTube ranking algorithm at all. What really matters is consistent engagement and people not dropping off. So go into our YouTube analytics, have a look at the relative audience retention graph, and this will show you sort of roughly um, how your video is doing, and those dips are where people are dropping out, and those peaks are where they're kind of deciding to watch the video to the end. And you want to make sure that you're getting everything looking quite nice above that average meter. Um, Sorry, Paddy and Dave, but you should make sure that anything that is not doing very well for you on YouTube, go and mark it as unlisted, which is basically like putting a no-index tag on your YouTube video. And the reason for this is that actually you need consistent quality across your channel to boost overall rankings. If you have a YouTube channel with like two really good videos and 25 crappy ones, the whole thing is going to be devalued. Google seem to rank um, YouTube channels as much like kind of overall websites. And it's like having a domain with you know, two really good pages and then the rest is just crappy. You need to have it lean and you need to have it mean. So trim the stuff off and instead of deleting it, just mark it as unlisted because then you retain the overall view count for your videos and you're not just losing out there. So how can you optimize your videos for success with advertising if you're doing YouTube true view, true view, bleh, true view advertising? Oh, that's a stupid name, isn't it? Um, well, you probably will be aware that this is a problem. And I know that this is true because this actual meme got 1,597 upvotes on Reddit. Um, and there's a problem that most people just seem to think of YouTube ads as like TV ads, and they should be treated the same way, and then nobody wants to watch them. And actually, the core is to get engagement in that first five seconds before people click the skip ad button, which they're inevitably going to do because you're just getting in the way of them watching a cat video or whatever. Um, you want to see an example of this done effectively? You now want to go and see what the rest of that video is about, don't you? Yeah, I'll leave, you, I'll leave that to you. Um, ad spend is social proof. Now, what this means is actually if you pay for advertising, it's not going to help your rankings. But what it will do is get more view counts um, on your YouTube videos. This is the most viewed uh, video on our distilled YouTube channel, 77,000 views, all paid. Um, frankly, they're all paid. It costs us about five grand to do that, just advertising our training platform. Um, and the value here is that actually if something looks like it's got loads of views, people are going to click on it. Um, which means you're going to get more and more organic views. So views, we get views. And additionally, if you pay for ads, you will get these nice sort of overlays when, everybody's, when anyone's watching it as a pre-roll ad. But also, anytime somebody chooses to watch that video organically, this ad is going to remain there and can be a nice way to, a nice call to action that may drive a bit of traffic to your site that sort of is going to inform people about what's going on. And those 
clicks and all that stuff is free if somebody's chosen to watch the video organically. So uh, nice thing you should do. Everyone should do a little bit of um, paid YouTube advertising just for this purpose, I think. However, don't expect these links to drive much traffic. YouTube does not typically drive much traffic to your site. And I have evidence for this. I've done some research of 95 individual company YouTube channels. Everyone who we, who we had analytics access to at Distilled who also had a YouTube channel. Um, some really big names in there, and there was 900 million views in total to look at. And that had an average click-through rate of everybody kind of optimizing their videos properly of 0.72%. YouTube does not drive much traffic back to your site. The real value you're going to get from those kind of overlays and YouTube advertising is brand awareness. That is what YouTube is for. It is not for SEO or anything like that. So building some links, right? We're SEOs. We want to build some fucking links all the time. Uh, a few nice ways you can do this with video. There is a problem. If you are doing... Um, if you're putting your videos on YouTube or Vimeo or any of those social platforms, when people choose to embed those videos, they don't link back to your site. They link back to YouTube or Vimeo.com, which isn't great. Um, so how do you prevent this? Well, at least initially, you need to ensure that the video is only visible on your domain, which means that it's securely hosted. And I recommend using Wistia. I'm pimping their wares today. Um, and they've just launched a new feature that will actually allow you to ensure that anytime somebody chooses to embed a video from your site, a, Wist a Wistia video from your site, it will include a backlink at the end in the HTML, um, just like a text link, uh, adding credit back to the page in the original source of the video. So it allows you to build links with video as a matter of course, naturally. Um, really nice little feature there. If you don't want to use Wistia for any reason, then I've actually built a tool that will do more or less the same thing in a slightly less elegant way, and that's sort of dist.till slash video hyphen embed hyphen generator. I'll share the slides later. Um, but you're thinking, yeah, but actually, I would want to put my link bait sort of videos on YouTube and Vimeo because the social traction is important, and those platforms are definitely the best place to get that social traction, which I agree with. So there's a way around that, and that is to securely host to start with, do all your outreach and try and get as many links as you can, and then put the stuff on YouTube afterwards after that initial outreach has dried up. It's like bait and switch, but White House style. Ooh. There's a little report in YouTube Analytics then called Embedded Player on Other Websites. And this will show you how many people have embedded on which websites people have embedded your video. And you can then go and download this into a CV and then outreach to all those people and say, hey, thanks for embedding my YouTube video. Um, you can also do the same using Open Site Explorer or Majestic or whatever uh, to see who has linked to the video but not actually embedded it. And then you can go and say, hey, you know, thanks for linking to my video. Really great, really appreciate it. Um, any chance you could actually change the embed for this high definition embed that I've got, which is much higher quality, runs faster, et cetera, and ensure you include a little credit link at the bottom there. So you can sort of go back and try and clean up those links. And you typically find you get quite a good response from this sort of link building because they've already linked your content, right? It's a, it's a nice warm lead. Pro tip for anyone agency side, if you're taking on a new client, for God's sake, go and like see if they've got a load of successful YouTube videos because it's a source of really, really quick links winning. There's a company called Unruly Media. They're based out of um, Brick Lane in London, and what they do is social video advertising, essentially seeding YouTube videos to vloggers to try and make stuff go viral. But they have a customizable player. And these little share buttons at the bottom can be customized so that when somebody watches the YouTube video on one of these blogs that they've seeded it to, and then they click share, they will actually share the version of the video on your site. Now, obviously, use this carefully, but if you want to do it, it can be done. And you can also ensure that when um, somebody clicks embed, they embed the version of the video with the link at the bottom as well. Um, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I'd recommend speaking to Jonathan Lucas, who is one of the uh, sales guys at Unruly UK. Uh, he's actually adopted the moniker JLU, not JLO. Sorry, that's JLO. Um, JLU. And uh, it's normally five grand minimum spend on a Unruly, so possibly not for the smaller companies. But if you're doing a kind of viral video campaign, you can use that to build some nice links as well. And I'd recommend speaking to them. Come and chat to me if you want an introduction. Uh, you can also interview your customers for links. And one of our clients in London called Simply Business have started doing this. And they've got some epic links. It's essentially like ego bait for maybe your customers, influential people in the industry, whatever. Um, and of course, if you create a video of somebody and make them look really cool and sharp and do the production nicely, they're going to embed it and link to it because they look great, right? It's a fantastic bit of ego bait. Um, we did the same with uh, Richard Baxter from SEO Gadget. Cheers to the link there, Rich. Um, and there's probably some of you in the audience thinking, ah, oh, this talk's been fine, Phil, but you know what? Like, I can't do any of this because, oh, it's terrible. I don't have any budget, and oh, help me, help me. Well, you know what? There is some stuff you can do. Um, the YouTube API allows you to embed custom YouTube playlists on your own site without having them visible on YouTube.com. So what you can do is find all the best videos in your niche, build a custom playlist, embed it on your blog, um, make sure it's not visible on YouTube.com, and then for sort of build links through content curation, I built a tool that will allow you to do this. It's at dist.tool slash YouTube hyphen playlist hyphen tool. Uh, additionally, you can do stuff with Vine if you have a smartphone, which I'm sure most of you do. 
say with Instagram video. Uh, we don't know which one's going to be more dominant yet. I think probably Vine. Um, but this is a great way of sort of just doing some interesting content. It won't cost you much. And I think there's going to be great rewards for the companies that work out how to do something exciting with Vine and Instagram. Uh, and Google Plus Hangout on Air, right? Like Google Plus Hangout on Air, all you need is a webcam on a laptop, and you can go. Easy, nice, great way to do some thought leadership video. It's integrated with YouTube. It can get you a lot of nice return and get you some good views and all that stuff. Try to look a bit more professional with Will Critchlow when you do it. If you're doing that kind of stuff, pay the 60 quid and get one of these little microphones, um, a little Samsung microphone, which is a great little thing um, that will actually just improve the quality. A small little condenser microphone works off USB, will make you sound so much more professional. OK, I'm just going to really finish up in the last few seconds I've got by covering the phantom menace, the question I always get several times a week in my inbox or any conferences, which is, where should I host my video? And my answer is, always, what are you trying to achieve? There is no one size fits all answer to this question at all. That said, there are trends. If you are trying to get conversions, traffic to your own site, all that kind of stuff, make sure you are self-hosting your video and not putting it on YouTube. This goes for product videos, anything designed to increase conversions. This is because, as I showed, people don't click back from YouTube to your site very much. Um, and actually, it's not that content isn't relevant outside of the page uh, that it's on. If you've done a product video, it's not relevant outside of that product page. That's where people should be seeing it, because it should be about taking them from that point of interest to then conversion. If you are trying to increase brand awareness, that's when you should be using YouTube. It will give the video the greatest visibility. And if you're trying to do links and social shares, then you can self-host, then do YouTube afterwards, as I showed earlier. But you're thinking, ah, but that can't be the case, Phil, because you actually need to have content on YouTube, all your content on YouTube, because YouTube has this one billion audience, and if I don't put my content on YouTube, I'm not, oh, not going to find these billion people. Not true. The YouTube, while YouTube does have a massive audience, they're the same people using Google, Twitter, social. Just by not having your content on YouTube does not mean it won't get found by people. And you're thinking, OK, well, I've got this one video for my company. It's really good. Can I do everything? Can I get rich snippets, conversions? Can I build brand awareness? Can I build links with it? Um, and my answer is probably not. It's like trying to have your cake and eat it too. Um, video is going to be much, much better when you target one specific goal, because the technical implementation can cannibalize. If you are trying to do content for conversions and rich snippets and build links, the content won't be appropriate for both those things. If you're trying to get conversions and rich snippets and improve your brand awareness, you're going to find that YouTube will outrank you for money terms, potentially branded terms, that you would like to get traffic for. Um, so you're much, much better just choosing one goal and sticking with it. Content will best, be, uh, will best support a goal when it's created with that goal in mind. Let technical goals drive the, uh, let business goals, sorry, drive the technical and the creative. So work out what you're trying to do, and then you can do it. And remember, I said you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You can hire a really good um, videographer, come in, take loads of footage, and then repurpose content just from having a good editor. That's the most important thing. So segment your strategy by goal, and then re-edit it to make it fit that goal if needs be. So think big, start small, and ship it. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. I've got a confession to make. I saw those slides, so didn't wear that shirt, <laughs> um, which is terrible. But thanks again, Phil Nottingham. You're welcome. Cheers, we good?